Welcome everyone, and thank you for joining us for our first program of the New York Book Forum. The New York Book Forum is a recently formed nonprofit tax exempt organization. It is dedicated to building bridges between the entire book publishing world and the public with an emphasis on the importance of reading and promoting literacy. My name is Janet McCarthy Grimm, and I am the current president of the New York Book Forum. According to an article in the Library Journal from April 2020, the National Center for Educational Statistics notes that 21% of adults in the United States fall into either the illiterate category or the functionally illiterate category. The article goes on to say that in the elementary high school space, nearly two thirds of fourth graders are reading below grade level. And by the time they graduate from high school, those percentages have not changed. This second statistic is the space where tonight's president, speaker, Kyle Zimmer, CEO and co-founder of First Book operates. As you will hear, First Book is built upon the premise of providing equal access to a quality education to children from the ages of zero to 18, growing up in low income families across the United States. Not surprisingly, First Book actually provides far more than just books. I would like to invite you to watch this brief video clip that the first book organization shared with us to open our program this evening. It illustrates exactly why their work is so crucial. Let's have a look. New York City has approximately 1.1 million children in our public school system. And the students come from every background of the social economic spectrum that you can possibly think of. We have a diverse population of students that attend our school. A lot of children from homeless shelters, domestic violence shelters, and the projects. When a child can read, it makes a tremendous difference in their quality of life. And most importantly, if they're able to see characters in books that look like them, it allows them to dare to dream. We see the need for books, books that relate to them, books that can speak to their life experiences. When a child sees him or herself, you're proud of who you are. You're familiar with that. Diversity in books is important because it's that mirror image. It makes them confident of their features, their looks. It gives them an opportunity to build that respect and tolerance that is definitely needed in today's society. Investing in diverse content is a strategy that creates the best narrative for all. First Book has been the answer to building bridges and building partnerships with the communities that we serve. Together we've been able to give over a quarter of a million books to children that, that are in need. When they get that brand new book and they crack open the cover and they feel a sense of pride. It creates, you know, a level of excitement and a level of what's possible. The impact that education has, that reading has, it's doable. All we have to do is give them the way in, and the way in is books that are familiar to them. First book has really etched a mark on our children and their families. Kyle, I'd like to welcome you tonight, and thank you so much for agreeing to join us. We've known each other for a long time now, and the first book uh, for our meeting, we really wanted to address a speaker um, that had to do with literacy issues, and we want more people to know about first book and its important work. 
You co-founded First Book nearly 30 years ago. Why did you start it? It's so great. First of all, it's so great to be here, Janet. It's uh, it's an honor, but it's also just a wonderful opportunity. I feel like I'm with family, you know, people who care so deeply about uh, books and about reading and with you, of course, a dear friend for all these years. And uh, so I'm just I'm uh, to be your inaugural guest is just a, a wonderful honor. So so thanks for inviting me. And the founding of First Book was uh, about 30 years ago. We celebrate our 30th birthday on May 19th in 2021. So mark your calendars. I, uh, I, I think that I started it with a couple of friends, but it was all based on very personal experiences. I grew up, I was lucky enough to grow up in a home where the bookshelves were full where my parents deeply uh, valued education and recognized its importance. And, and I know what it did for my life. I know what it did in the lives of my brothers and sisters. And then I, you know, I moved to Washington, I became a lawyer. And in the late 80s and early 90s, the crack epidemic hit Washington, DC. And I was not only raised to believe in education, I was raised to believe in the importance of community activism. And so when that kind of struggle hit my hometown of Washington, I rolled my sleeves up and started working at a soup kitchen uh, after hours, at, uh, you know, during the week, a few times a week. And every time I would go in there, the place would be filled with kids who were looking for a, a meal, of course, but they were looking for adult intervention. They were looking for a safe place to hang out. And I would look at these great smiles and I would think to myself, I, you know, I'm not an educator, but if I just had some great books to read with these kids, it would be a real opportunity for them. Uh, so I, it, 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 kind of enchanted me. And I became a student uh, of what book access looked like in the Washington DC area initially for kids in need, um, and, and then nationally. I spent some afternoons going around to local schools asking to see you know, their libraries, asking to see their classroom resources. Uh, and I was devastated by what I saw. And, really based on that experience, that's how First Book started. We uh, realized to our, uh, to, our, to our sadness, to our devastation that kids in need all over the country are lacking access to books. That, you know, it, it's far more the rule than it is the exception. And I remember one uh, study a few years back by Susan Newman, who many of us probably on this on this uh, call know, uh, where she she came into Washington and she found a neighborhood. It's called Anacostia. It struggles economically, but it's a great old historic part of the town. But she found that there was one book for every 830 kids. And you, you can't look at the finding of a study like that and then act like you're surprised that our fourth grade proficiency levels are what they are. You know, it's none of us can be surprised. All of us should be embarrassed. And, and this country, this wealthy country um, needs to take action. And really that was what first book was founded on, that kind of personal experience and then build on the, the research and the, uh, the great work of others. Thank you, Kyle. You started the first book as a nonprofit social enterprise. Can you explain a little bit about what that means and why that was the approach you took? Well, you know, a, a social enterprise, first book is a nonprofit. We're a 501c3, like the New York Book Forum. Um, and But a social enterprise means that we borrow the best thinking from the for-profit world and we apply those strategies to social issues. In our case, educational equity for kids in poverty. And 
if you consistently evaluate the best in class ideas of the for profit sector and you apply it to this much younger sector of the social sector, I think we can cover a lot more ground. We can have a lot bigger impact. And, you know, First Book doesn't just stop there. We borrow the best strategies from government. We borrow the best strategies from community organizing. Uh, we really go out and try to harvest all the great campaigns and try to evaluate them and apply those, those, that great thinking to reaching every kid, to reaching every teacher with the power of books and education. And how do you how do you do that? How do you go about harvesting those ideas and turning them into a real life part of your program? You know, it's um, I think Janet, it's it's um, it, it's a lot of basic not very glamorous work. You know, we study the research, we sharpen our pencils and look at, um, uh, you know, what a, what, a, what a business plan ought to look like. And let me, let me give you an example. So at the beginning of first book, we began to evaluate the need for books. We were very aware of Susan Newman's studies and many, many others that showed not only the impact of having books in the lives of kids, the importance of that, but also the profound chasm of need in that category. How many schools didn't have uh, libraries in their facilities? How many, what school, what classroom libraries look like in affluent areas versus uh, areas that were struggling economically? We did all of that analysis and then we sat down and we analyzed the publishing industry. And we said, what, what is going on that there's this disconnect? The US produces the most beautiful books for kids in the world. They're jaw-droppingly beautiful. And yet there is, there is this chasm. There's millions and millions of kids who simply don't have access to those books. So we really approached it as a business question. And we said, there's a supply side to this and there's a demand side to this. And it, we looked at the structures of the publishing industry. We looked at the fact that it was built on a consignment model. And that has a, that has a major impact on the pricing. We looked at pricing of picture books, you know, that average about the premium picture books that average about 19 bucks a piece. And you realize that the, part of the American publishing industry for those premium books that are that no kid should ever grow up without is really in the upper five and 10% of the US socioeconomic ladder. And so we really began the business analysis of how do you connect the business model of the publishing industry with what could be a very large new market for them? And we built the first book marketplace. And the first book marketplace is uh, a, a, an e-commerce site where we went to the publishers and we asked for their excess inventory that they had available for contribution. We combined that a few years later with strategies to purchase inventory from the publishers on behalf of this uh, this uh, a group of educators serving kids in need, and um, and combining business strategies, we really have built what in essence is a closed market that is focused only on educators serving kids most in need in schools, in after schools, in preschools, and I can describe the community to you. I'm happy to do that, but we really approached our designs using business strategy. How do we use the brilliant work of the publishers? How do we get it to this new market? Could you expand a little bit on who the educators are and how do you find them? And once you find them, how does that actually increase access to books to these children? Sure, I, at the heart of first book 
is uh, the First Book Network. This is our online community. And our community is literally anyone serving, any adult serving in the lives of kids in need. And so it can be uh, a title, a teacher in a Title I school. It can be an after school person who's working in a community program, healthcare settings, librarians, uh, homeless shelters, domestic violence centers. I, it, almost if you can imagine it, and they're serving at a minimum 70% children from low income families, they are welcome to register with First Book online. It takes about five to seven minutes. They give us their bona fides and, um, and they're welcome into the community. There's no cost to registration. There's no obligation when you register. We want everybody in that tent, in that community. And the importance of that is really significant. You know, we look at labor unions in this country and we recognize how powerful they are. Political parties, we recognize how powerful they are because what those kinds of institutions have done is they have aggregated very broad, very large groups of people under a few tenets that those groups of people hold in common. And what has never happened until First Book is an aggregation of formal and informal educators all in the lives of children in poverty aggregated together because their central pillars that they hold in, in common is the, the educational advancement for the kids they serve. And so we now have, I'm delighted to report, about 510,000 members in our, uh, in our online community. We're growing at about a thousand a week. That growth rate has been going on for several years running. And, uh, and it's thrilling because it's the first time an organization has brought in that breadth of, of, of educator and that depth. So we have sort of a national but hyper local reach and uh, we intend to grow that. We're trying to reach 2 million educators in the next five or six years. Well, that's an ambitious plan. I, I wish you all the luck in the world and hopefully programs like this will help you get there. Absolutely. Um, I know that from past conversations that the book bank is just one of the different um, pillars of the of the first book organization. Could you describe, first of all, how the book bank works uh, just sure. briefly? And could you talk a little bit about the other two branches of your organization and how it is helping um, move towards that goal of 2 million people signed up? Sure, I'm, I'm happy to, of course. The, the first book marketplace is, the online, it's the e-commerce site that houses both the First Book National Book Bank, which is contributed inventory from the publishers and also purchased inventory from the publishers. And so the First Book National Book Bank, our publishing uh, partners have been unbelievably generous over all these 30 years. And they have given us millions and millions of beautiful books that we've been able to pull together, place them in our warehouse and distribute to the people who are certified members of our online community who I've just described. And so we never charge that online community uh, for those contributed books. We only ask them uh, to pay a small shipping and handling fee that ranges between 60 and 75 cents per book. So the books remain free when they're contributed to us. Uh, that's an extraordinary resource for our 510,000 members. And they look forward to it. They're grateful for it. You should see the kids when they're able to do those distributions. They're thrilled. Um, and, and the other half of the first book national or the first book marketplace 
is purchased inventory. What we realized 13, 14 years ago was that we couldn't solve the problems uh, of providing what the educators really needed to reach their kids, what they really needed to uh, perform the lessons that they were trying to, to implement in their schools and programs based entirely on gifted inventory. So we went back to the publishers and we said, look, there's an entire group of institutions at the base of the economic pyramid that are not buying books at retail because they cannot afford them. And we would propose that we will aggregate that group of institutions, which is the first book online community. We'll pull them together. We will purchase from publishers on a non-returnable basis. We'll purchase without any marketing costs. We'll purchase without any customer acquisition costs. We'll knock every risk and every cost off the table that we can. And we ask in return that you sell us that inventory that we hand select at the lowest price that we can get it. But we want the publishers to make a thin margin because this whole thing that I'm describing, it has to be sustainable in order to grow large enough to scale to meet this need. And so, uh, so then we offer those books for resale on our website, only to the groups, only to the educators who are certified as serving children in poverty. And we uh, and the publishers again have been extraordinarily generous wonderfully uh, uh, engaged. And as a result, First Book has uh, provided well over 200 million books uh, to the children we serve over our 30 years. And um, it's been a wonderful partnership really between First Book in the social sector and the publishers in, in, uh, in, in, in the corporate sector. Uh, and, and we're proud of what we've done, but we, you know, we're never really satisfied because we know how big the need is. Well, there's always more to do no matter how much we've done. Indeed. Um, if you could talk about the other two business units, if you will. Sure. You know, what we, what we did as this, as our network has grown, as this community has grown, we realized that the most important voice was that of the educators. And so we began surveying them. We began having regular focus groups. And as we would talk to them, we would say, what do you need? What do you want? And, um, and they, they are very engaged. So they would come back to us with a range of questions, a range of issues, some of which were book related, some of which were uh, wonderful new opportunities for first book. For example, they came back to us uh, a few years ago and said, we need winter coats for our kids because when the temperature drops, attendance drops. And, uh, and you know, you know, Janet, once you've built something, it's not so hard to add extra components to it. And so, we have added winter coats, we've added backpacks, we've added laptops, we've added uh, school supplies, we've added hygiene kits for homeless kids, uh, underwear and t-shirts and socks and, uh, and toothpaste and soap and blankets, <coughs> all of which were driven by practitioners telling us what the needs were that they saw directly in their classroom. So that, uh, that interaction where we began surveying them, we began to see that that was vital, not just to our programmatic efforts, but that that would be a tremendous asset to anyone serving kids in poverty uh, from corporations trying to design products, from uh, curriculum developers and academics, and so we've stood up on its legs something called First Book Research and Insights. And we've, over the last five years, we've built wonderful new capacities for data analytics that allow us, based on age, geography, lots of different criteria, to be able to run surveys, run focus groups, and, and report 
to our constituents exactly what's going on in the field, what educators need, what they see in the lives of their kids. And the third leg is something called the accelerator. And the accelerator, once again, is born from the needs that we hear about from our uh, from our online community, you know, from the educators themselves, they will say to us that, you know, they feel as though they are not fully prepared for some of the challenges that can, that that they're facing. You know, they will say, we don't know the latest research on child development. We don't know the latest research on how to teach reading. We would like to, most recently, about 18 months ago, 65% of our uh, respondents said, we would love to talk about race and culture in our classroom or program, but the truth is we're afraid of it. We're afraid we'll misspeak. We're afraid we'll be misunderstood. And so what that allowed us to do through the accelerator, we take those issue areas we identify the people who are the real thought leaders in the field, and we work with them to package their findings, their strategies, their guidance to, trans to practitioners, and we package it in webcasts, in downloadables, in parent guides, in PSAs, and we make it available for free on the first book marketplace. So those are the three legs, the marketplace, First Book Research and Insights, and The Accelerator. Thank you, Kyle. It's very incredibly interesting. I wonder if you could talk about the value of a child owning his or her own book and how it, that empowers the child moving forward. You know, um, at one level, there's nothing simpler than this. You know, you can't teach a kid to play the piano and love the piano without a piano. And you can't teach a kid to read and love books and love reading without books and without great books. And so um, I know from several uh, massive survey uh, analyses that there's something like 1,100 studies that validate the importance of kids having access to books. I know that. Uh, and uh, at the same time, all of us know it from our very own experience, right? There is something about cracking that book open. There's something about seeing yourself in that book, uh, which goes directly to the need for diversity in children's content that first book has been really dedicated to. There's something about that that both from an academic perspective is critical. We know that. We know that reading skills are advanced, but it's also from a, um, a self-esteem perspective. You know, I've laughed with friends over the years that I was the youngest of five, and I don't know how old I was when I got something that wasn't handed down from my older brothers and sisters, but I remember distinctly getting a brand new pair of, this will date me, red ball jet sneakers. <laughs> and I thought for, a, you know, when I put those on, they were brand new. And I thought I can run faster and I can jump higher, not because of me, but because of these magical new red ball jets I had on. And I smile when I look back on that because that's, the power. That's exactly what we're talking about. Kids feel that they're important because they've been given this. They are given a, a doorway into a whole new adventure when they read it. And we all know that it plays out academically for success for them. Right. Without a doubt. And I'm sure those were the best red sneakers anybody's ever had. They are. They, they are the best red sneakers. <laughs> Kyle, there was a quote in the promotional flyer for this program from an article in Kirkus about how important it is that, and this is part of the quote, that publishing books about children of color can make a difference to the bottom line. Can we expand on that current emphasis nationally on diversity and inclusion and talk about 
how that fits in with first books thinking and they're particularly um, the stories, the stories for all project that you've been working on. And if you could go into that in a little bit of depth, I think that'd be sure. interesting to our audience. Thank you. Of course, of course. Um, you know, this is an issue that I think the earliest I have, I'm aware of it is I saw a Saturday evening review article uh, from like the 50s or the 60s uh, that was exactly about uh, the, the uh, lack of diversity in, um, in children's books. And so We've been talking about this for decades. This is not a new issue. First Book has been working on this consistently for 30 years. We formally launched uh, an initiative called Stories for All, as you, as you noted, in 2013. Um, and what, it, what we've done through Stories for All is recognize that um, kids need to see themselves in, in books. Of course, that's true. Kids also need to see others in books. We've got a lot of we got a lot of time to make up to make sure that we are all aware of the wonderful diversity that this country has, and that the, the classrooms and the programs that we serve they're all wonderfully diverse. They look like the UN, you know, when you walk in, and. Um, and so we really became formally dedicated to that in 2013. And Stories for All is a, sort of the banner program underneath which we've tried a multiple different strategies. One was we uh, have we've made large scale purchases of highly diverse titles uh, from the publishers and offered them very very intentionally up. Up, you know, increasing the percentage of diverse content books on our first book marketplace. It runs now about 40 to 45 percent of all the books that we make available. That's critically important to us. We have run studies through first book research and insights that have where 90 plus percent of our respondents have said that they know, uh, and these are practicing educators, that when they can offer books that show diversity, cultural and racial and family structure diversity, that the kids are more active, they're more interested, they're more engaged in the stories and books. So we know that from our own independent research. Um, and, and right now we're working on new strategies to take those beautiful premium hardcover books that the publishers are making available increasingly every year. The publishers are adding authors of color uh, and they're coming in in premium editions. They're stunning books, but they're expensive books. And so we are doing fundraising right this second to uh, try to purchase special editions of those premium books uh, to make them available on the first book marketplace so that we can get them out to as many kids in need as we possibly can. Uh, and I'm, I'm completely dedicated to that because we, we hear every day from our educators how critical that is. And, and, I, and I wish you all the best of luck in, in moving forward on that program because it's critically important, as you say. You know, Jen, one thing I was going to tell you is I remember I'm from Southern Ohio. I grew up in like the foothills of the Appalachian Mountains, right? And I we did a book distribution uh, back then. And I walked in and, you know, to the distribution, the tables were piled high. And, and, uh, and this is an area of the country that's very poor uh, and very white. And this little boy came flying over to me and who was coming to the distribution. And he uh, he was a, a white boy and he could have been my son, you know? And he came flying over and in his best, deepest Southern Ohio accent said, can you show me where the Spanish books are? And I, I thought to myself, I looked at this little boy's face and I thought, I said to him, are, are, are they teaching you Spanish? He's like eight. 
And I thought, boy, things have changed here. This is great. And he said, no, but I know that this is my big chance and I want a Spanish book. And I, I had that little boy in the back of my head because you know, we, I don't want us to fall into the trap of thinking that diverse content is just for kids who oh, are from racial and cultural backgrounds. Right. Because that little boy knew that there was a big world out there and he was going to fit into it and he wanted to learn. And so I just, I always love that kid and I carry him around in my head and in my heart because it's a reminder that these diverse titles are essential for every kid growing up. Absolutely. And did you have one? Did you find him his Spanish I did. book? I did, of course. I was so in love with his question that I would have sat down and handwritten him one if I had to. But <laughs> I'm delighted to say that we actually had wonderful Spanish books that we, we could provide. But it's really thrilling to see that that firepower and we see it all the time with our kids they're so hungry for it you know that calls into question how good is your spanish and could you sit down and write a book in spanish no i could not no i could not <laughs> um, let's talk for a minute about this unusual year that we've just come through and um given the educational needs and the disparities between the socioeconomic classes and with the covid pandemic um and the educational equity issues that you're always looking to address. What's ahead for First Book and how did you process all of this during the pandemic year or it's more than a year now? Um, and what are your goals for the coming years partially as a result of what we've just experienced? Well, you know, I think that um, we, we've, of course, we've always been focused on kids in need, but I think that all of us became uh, more aware of the dramatic needs during this, you know, with business closures, with uh, unemployment uh, climbing, and with schools struggling mightily to reach kids with and, and recognizing technology, the failures of technology, devices were not, of course, even remotely uniformly available. And even once you had devices, connectivity is, uh, is a gigantic issue that we have to confront as a country. And um, these are not luxuries. These are not luxuries. Computers, connectivity, uh, this is as basic as access to a telephone was generations ago. And, um, and I think that I, I will tell you a, a couple of things that happened with First Book during this period. Um, one is once the teachers gain their footing and they gain their footing very quickly, within a couple of weeks of schools, you know, we all watch the news and watch schools closing in state after state. First Book sent out a survey and as part of that, and, and to say, what can we do? What do we need? What do you need? What did the kids need? And we got tens of thousands of responses. It was just an extraordinary expression of concern and dedication from the educators. And what they said to us was they had already started organizing themselves in wonderful ways. We had 8,000 educators in the first like three or four weeks step up and say that they would be mini distribution hubs. Some of them were aligned with school food distributions. Some of them were doing it out of their garages. You know, they were so worried about what was going to happen to those kids. Uh, in their classes. Uh, and, and so we saw just this extraordinary creativity and dedication. I tell you, the number of educators who would order books through us, get books, and, uh, and they would sit and, and bag up books for each child. They would hand select which titles they thought would most be most meaningful for that kid and they would do doorstep deliveries all over their community to make sure that they were reaching uh, the kids who they knew needed them. 
Um, and, and it was just, it was very moving. And, and it, 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 you know, it, it was really a, a wartime effort uh, and, and Herculean and, uh, and the educators will, you know, like I, I can hardly find the words to say how brave and strong they were during all of that. But the other group of people who stepped up were the publishers. I, I am telling you, I got on the phone with all of the publishers who we've worked with and I said, we need you like we've never needed you because the educators, uh, they were handing out books from their schools because at that point they didn't know whether you could you, you could get COVID from holding you know, a book or anything. So they were just handing out the books from their classrooms and giving everything they had. And the publishers stepped up. We had eight million books contributed in a very short amount of time. And, the, and so it was sort of uh, the perfect situation because we had you know, the, the educators waiting with open arms and we had the publishers with their, uh, with their always generous response. Uh, ready to give and give more. And uh, I, I really can't say enough about that. It, it was amazing. We also had uh, uh, companies like Intel come to us to use our platform, our capacities to distribute 17,000 computers in 45 school districts uh, so that they could elevate uh, in, you know, in their lane, resource, educational resources that they knew kids were struggling uh, for. So we worked with them and we're still working with them on wonderful connectivity uh, efforts that we've undertaken. So that's, uh, uh, it, it's both a, a tough tale, but it's a tale of heroes, you know, and, and uh, one that we, we should all celebrate, I think. That, uh, that the publishing industry stepped up like the heroes they've always been and, uh, and gave deeply to kids who were desperate. And you just explained to many of the people in our audience why all of a sudden they had such a surge in reprint activity during the pandemic <laughs> period. Thank you, Kyle, for that. And there are probably a few of them that are sitting there shaking their heads in just utter amazement because they had no idea that's where the 8 million books were going. Well, it, um, it, it, I mean, it it was uh, it was deeply necessary, and man, people rose to the rose to the cause. You know, Janet, you ask uh, also where we're headed, and I want to make sure I I spend at least a moment to talk about that. Um, we've got great ambitions at First Book, and we have no intention of slowing down. And so, First Book has launched. Um, a, a, we've announced just this last uh, month a $15 million fund that we are raising uh, that will that is uh, that is designed to be $7 million in patient capital alone and $8 million in grant that will allow us over the next five and six years to quadruple in size our network of educators from our current 500,000 to 2 million. We know they're out there. We know how to find them. We know how to sign them up. That will aggregate that group of people and will provide them with enormous opportunities in terms of all kinds of books, all kinds of content, and, and will elevate those opportunities across the board. And so, you know, we, uh, uh, you know, I used to think as I got older, I might get more patient and, and more relaxed. And I'm afraid that the opposite is true. Uh, the older I get, the faster I want things to move. So we are on it and we're really moving. And of course, if anyone has ideas about that, please give me a call. Well, I've known you for 30 years and you're not getting more patient, Kyle. <laughs> In case you needed that validated, I can promise you that's not happening. So for those of us in our audience today, whether they're people that are listening in because of the New York Book Forum or others who are joining the program. If somebody wants to participate in first book or contribute or how, how does the general public 
support first book? How do they help identify programs that might be eligible for your educators program? Um, but what what would you what words of wisdom can you share with our audience today? Well, I would love to have every everybody involved because you know the truth is we need everybody. Um, this is uh, these issues are not just something publishers can uh, address on their own. They are not something that just the social sector can address on their own. We've got to link arms if we're ever going to make the needle move in a meaningful way. And so I would suggest there are three things. One is. Um, help us sign up every eligible classroom and program. Uh, go to firstbook.org. It's very easy. It says register. There's a button right on the site. It takes five or six minutes. So if you have, if you're involved in your church or a service group or any other institution, uh, please just send that message out and let's get everybody signed up. Secondly, uh, donate. You know, it's, uh, it, you know, money is, I, I wish it weren't, but money is essential to making all of these things happen. Uh, First Book has a 30 year history of success. We have 30 years of squeezing every nickel that comes through the door to make to maximum impact but we really need those nickels to come into the door. So again, go to firstbook.org uh, and please make any kind of contribution. And finally, I'd say, um, help us think creatively about partnerships, about organizations, about corporations we should be working with. You know, um, the trick on this is to get bright, motivated activists from every sector around tables talking about what how we avoid mistakes and how we you know reach for that next rung and so if you have an idea about somebody or some corporation or a foundation or anybody who you think might be helpful email me it's k zimmer at firstbook.org i'd be glad to hear from you and we are building this we have great infrastructure and we we really it's on the launch pad and we really want to take it to the moon well thank you kyle that sounds ambitious and i'm sure that you're going to get there because you're not patient i'm not patient don't be patient <laughs> um I think that there might be some questions from the group. So let me just take okay. a look here and see whether or not there's anything coming across the wire that we need to answer. Um, the first question is, could you describe a little more about the resources in your online um, book? bank, bookstore, if you will. First marketplace. Right. Besides books, you said you mentioned coats and socks. And I think I read a, a public re uh, release recently that, that you were had added diapers to that. We did just um, add diapers. And, which is amazing. And so I, the question is, are you are, could you talk a little bit more about the breadth of product you offer besides books? and a little more color around why of course uh, of course you know the truth is is that educational equity requires all these things and let me give you the example of diapers there is a rule with most of the uh most of the daycares that you can't leave your child in the daycare without leaving and it varies sometimes it's three days worth of diapers sometimes it's a week worth of diapers but that's a real expense it's diapers are very expensive especially for people who when we're facing the unemployment rates that we've been facing and people working at minimum wage. That's an enormous investment. And so what we realized is that not only was it a necessary commodity in order for kids from low income families to get into those early educational settings where they could have educational experiences and opportunities that would lay the groundwork for them for, for academic success later, that something as trivial as a diaper 
you know, that might seem as trivial as a diaper, in fact, became a significant barrier. And so we did, we, we just launched uh, diapers in that, uh, in that category. They're available on the site. It's a pilot phase. We're trying to figure out how that new product category works. But let me give you another example. We were contacted a few years back by the governor of Delaware, and he had done some work um, with his school system, his Title I schools, and educators had said that the kids needed basic supplies and that they were distracted because they didn't have them. They didn't have paper and pencil at home. Things that a lot of us are lucky enough to, uh, to imagine are ubiquitous. They're not ubiquitous. And so uh, he came to us and his team came to us and we built something for them in 45 schools in the first year, and then we expanded it to 90 schools, and it's still going, called care closets. These are a, a dedicated closet in each of those 90 schools in the lowest income areas in Delaware, where they're stocked with uh, coats, uh, they're stocked with toothbrushes and t-shirts and soap and blankets and all kinds of things like that, backpacks, school supplies, so that an educator, a teacher in those classrooms who begins to recognize that this child doesn't have a coat, that that child doesn't have paper, and, and you should hear the stories. Kids are desperately trying to do their homework on the backs of uh, of paper that's bit, that's completely inappropriate for a school setting because they have nothing else. And so these closets allowed an educator to very discreetly take a kid by the hand and walk them down the hallway and say, you know what, you get what you need because these are barriers to equitable education and they're intolerable and in a nation this wealthy, they should never exist. And so we, just like we do with books, which is heart and soul of our lives and our programs, so we bring the same effort, the same uh, magnitude to bear for these other commodities because we recognize how critical they are. Kyle, another question came in. Um, who in your organization are there people that are interfacing with the publishers and who are the publishing companies are you interfacing with in your organization? Is it through the sales department or is it through, uh, does it vary publisher to publisher or? It, it does vary a bit. I mean, I, I have known a lot of the uh, senior levels of the children's houses for, for years. And so I'm, I'm certainly involved. We do have a, gr a wonderful group of people who are in charge at, on first book side of uh, uh, sales and managing those agreements with publishers and things like that. In addition, we have uh, a, a, uh, uh, a group of people who select books, who I believe I would put up against anybody. And they, they're they extraordinary. They know every, every title. They seek advice outside the organization. So we make sure that we, and, and of course, we're always talking to our, our own uh, uh, educators to get as much input as we can. But it's, it's, you know, it depends on what you're talking about, what part of the relationship you're talking about. Now that you've been in this first book business for 30 years, what would you say is the thing that has changed the most and what has stayed the same the most? That's such a great question. Let's see, what, question. Has, <laughs> what has changed the most? Well, I think uh, the book industry over the past 30 years, um, you know, like all of us, everyone, everyone watching is going to know that it's it's profoundly different. Um, I think that um, what hasn't changed is the quality of the people in this industry. Um, you know, I was a lawyer for a number of years prior, and I can say with some degree of certainty that that's not true in every industry. It's just not. And there is a dedication to quality. There is uh, the number of times I've interacted with people in publishing where they're literally thrilled by a book that they've been able to bring to market. 
uh, by the quality of the illustration, by the quality of the print, you know, and they, the, and it shows, it comes, you know, right across the table from you when you're speaking with them. That's not every industry. That's an extraordinary thing. <laughs> so I think that publishing attracts that level of dedication that has not changed. I will smile with all of you that, you know, I remember 15 years ago, right, when uh, the death of the traditional printed book was <coughs> predicted, right? Everybody said, uh, in another 15 years, we'll all be uh, using heads up display or whatever to read. And, and that, of course, uh, I'm pleased to report has, has, has not happened. Of course, it will advance. Technology is going to advance. First Book is doing all kinds of pilots to make sure that we are uh, right up to pace with all of those changes in the industry. And of course, it's consolidated. And of course, on the retail side, it has consolidated. But I, uh, I think a lot of it, you know, as I'm thinking about this, I think, and I'm with, with joy, I'm saying this, has not changed. You know, that core dedication to quality has not changed. And, uh, you know, so I, 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 I love this industry, I've got to say. I, I, feel, uh, I feel like the luckiest person in the world that I get to work with people like that. Right. Well, Thank you so very much, Kyle. Um, I, we really appreciate you joining us this evening. Thank you to all of you viewers who have turned in, tuned, tuned into our first program and to hear about the importance of addressing literacy issues. We hope you will check out our website at newyorkbookforum.org. That's right after you get off the firstbook.org <laughs> website. You can go to our second. <laughs> um, we hope you'll join us for the next the pr next program we're going to have on Wednesday, June 16th, when we are going to be discussing issues of educational publishing with Jay Diskey, who is the former executive director of the Association of American Publishers in the pre-K to 12 learning space. Uh, along with other things, Jay is going to address how the pandemic impacted the learning efforts, especially in the underserved population, as Kyle was talking about today, and what the aftermath of the pandemic is doing to public funding and how that is going to play a, a role forward in educational materials. Before we end this meeting, I would like to thank the dedicated members of the board of directors of the New York Book Forum, Bridget Black, Martha Hansen, Andy Hughes, Mike Kwan, Zachary Lutz, Sarah Mayer, Karen Romano, and Jody saunders Ray. It has been a yeoman's effort getting this organization going. And without those individuals, we would not be here this evening. And thank you for joining us for this first program of the New York Book Forum featuring Kyle Zimmer and First Book. Please thank join you. us for other events moving forward. Thanks, Kyle. Thanks so much. Lovely to be here. Thank you. Have a great evening, everyone. Bye.